This coming Sunday is the fifth Sunday of the Easter season. And today for the Bible study, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the first reading and not just the verses of the first reading, which tell of the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, but the whole sequence of events leading up to his death. And then we're going to be spending a little bit of time on John 14, which is the gospel for this Sunday as well as the following Sunday. Now, uh, let's start with, uh, let's go back to the beginning of the story of Stephen as one of the first seven deacons. And that's, uh, for that, we have to go back to the beginning of Acts chapter 6. During those days, the disciples were increasing in numbers. More and more people were becoming followers of Jesus. And, you know, whenever there is uh, a number of people and wherever there is church, there always are problems. There always are issues. There always are problems. Well, the Hellenists, who would be uh, the Greek culture, Jewish Christians, Greek culture people who were Jewish, who had become followers of Jesus, they were complaining against the Hebrews, the Hebrew culture, Jewish Christians, uh, that there were the widows who were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. There is discrimination. There is not equality. Uh, their widows are getting a fairer share or a larger share of the pot than ours. And there was a complaining about that. And um, the 12 called together the whole community. This is a situation that they had to deal with. And the 12, who are the 12 disciples, now the 12 apostles, said, you know, there is so much work that we need to do. And um, so we need to now have you select seven people who will oversee in a fair and equitable way this distribution of resources for the widows. So select from among yourselves, the 12 involve the people who are making the complaint in solving the problem. Select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom. This is very typical Luke language. Luke is the uh, gospel writer and the history of the expansion of the church writer who emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit. So full of the spirit of wisdom whom we may appoint to this task. And I like the beginning of the next sentence. What they said pleased the whole community. That is always a great thing whenever there's a congregational meeting and, and there's a suggestion and everybody is happy with it. What they said pleased the whole community. And they chose seven people to be the first seven deacons, the ones that oversaw the distribution of the assistance to the widows. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Again, this is very typical of Luke language, full of the Holy Spirit, together with, and you'll notice that these are people that had Greek and or Roman kinds of names, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas a proselyte of Antioch. That one is interesting there where he is specifically mentioned as a proselyte, which means he is someone who did not actually grow up as a, um, within the Jewish faith, but was a later convert to Judaism. And so um, he was even more someone outside the original culture, uh, a non-Jewish person who became a follower of Jesus, a pros proselyte of Antioch. Now let's take a look at our map. Antioch is going to become the great center of outreach to the Gentile world or in the missionary journeys of Paul. Antioch is here located the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, uh, now, today, uh, the country of Turkey, there's a little bit, a section of Turkey that dips down into Syria, the Hatay province. Um, and the city today of Antakya, which is one of those cities that was just absolutely devastated by the uh, earthquake of a few months ago. But um, it's a major city now. In um, New Testament times, Antioch was also one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire, and this was the place from which Gentile an outreach to the Gentile world was able to be initiated. And it makes sense that it's going to be from Antioch rather than from in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is going to be so heavily involved with the Jewish community that if you're going to have significant outreach to the Gentile community, it's going to have to happen someplace else. 
And uh, when we get to a couple of verses later, it mentions members of the synagogue of the freed men who debate with Stephen. Uh, this is the only time in the Bible where it mentions this synagogue. This is probably a synagogue made up of people who themselves are freed slaves or the descendants of freed slaves. So this uh, group of Jewish people who were intense in their opposition to Stephen were from Cyrene, which is over on the north coast of Africa, Alexandria in Egypt. They're from um, Cilicia, which is uh, Paul's hometown area of Tarsus, and Asia. So these are, uh, so when we see the reference to these members of the synagogue of the freedmen who were opposed to Stephen, you can see where they came from. So everybody liked the idea, and there was good result. Verse 7, the word of God continued to spread. The dis number of disciples increased greatly, not just increased, but increased greatly, and even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Um, that a lot of Jewish priests became followers of Jesus. So this was a problem that had to be solved, a problem that was solved. It was solved successfully and isn't that great. When there's an issue and there's an idea, everybody likes the idea and it is implemented well. Now, Stephen, though, is not just someone that oversees the distribution of resources. Stephen, verses 8 and following, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. This also is another common emphasis of the author Luke in the book of Acts. Talks about the signs and wonders, the great works of the Holy Spirit, the miracles that are performed by the followers of Jesus, which um, impress the people and uh, give credibility to the faith. So he was very successful in, in his ministry and doing more than just making sure that funds are distributed fairly. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, again, that's the only time in the Bible where it's mentioned, probably either f former slaves or the descendants of former slaves, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, others from Cilicia and Asia, these different areas that were living in Jerusalem, they stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. They simply couldn't compete, which tends to make them kind of upset. And so what do they do? Well, they find ways to attack him. If you cannot um, you know, counter his arguments, then you attack the person, the argumentum ad hominem. I attack the person if I cannot counter the ideas. So they secretly instigated some people to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Let's try to discredit him since we can't counter what he says. And so they stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. And then they confronted him, seized him, brought him before the Jewish council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. He is constantly saying things against the temple and the law. We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Now that's kind of interesting because in John's account of the cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2, Jesus had said, even if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Meaning even if you kill me, he's talking about his own resurrection. But it's interesting that he said, even if you destroy me by killing me, I'll raise it up in three days. He was misquoted during the trial. One, this guy's dangerous. He said he's going to destroy the temple. Two, he's crazy because he said he could rebuild it in three days. We need to get rid of him. And so it's interesting that the same things that Jesus was accused of saying, now Stephen is accused of saying. Have you ever said something in complete innocence or meaning one thing and all of a sudden it keeps on coming back to you that you are accused of saying something else? Well, he's saying that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and then worse than uh, just as bad, change the customs that Moses handed to us. You know, people kind of freak out if they hear that the worship service is going to change or whatever. Destroy the temple and change things. They, that's plenty to freak out about. 
And so all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, um, we have then the record of his sermon, which is basically uh, he knew his Old Testament. And so he tells the story of God's acting in the uh, history of God's Old Testament people. And then, Acts 7, he kind of leads to a climax, a culmination. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. What they prided themselves on was being circumcised well, in terms of your ability to hear and see what God is saying. It's like you are uncircumcised. Now, I was relating to the concept of stiff-necked people because I've had a lot of soreness and stiffness in my neck and I'm now seeing a physical therapist and um, am doing exercises twice a day uh, to try to t turn my neck more. You might have noticed probably I, I have tended to kind of turn my own body, my whole body, because I can't turn my neck. And I told Terry, well, you know, I'm mostly concerned if it is sore rather than if it's stiff. And Terry says, well, if you're driving, I'm concerned if you can't turn your head and what won't you see in the lane next, not, next to you? Well, it's not good to be stiff-necked, but if you're stiff-necked, you, it often says you're stiff-necked and stubborn. And also, if you're stiff-necked, you can't see what's going around on around you. You stiff-necked people, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit. This is pretty inflammatory language, just as your ancestors used to do, like the mother that says to the child, you're as bad as your father, that kind of thing. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous ones, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. And he's really very, very pointed and direct, talking to very upset people. Well, this is kind of like throwing gasoline on the fire. They become enraged. And then filled with the Holy Spirit, again, very typically Lucan language, the filled by the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the, the glory of God. And this is where actually the first reading for this Sunday picks up. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So he's making a statement saying that Jesus is God. They get that, that just really sets them off. I mean, they already are mad and, and this is just too much. They cover their ears. They don't want to hear it. And with a loud shout, they all rush together against him. Now, this is the highest Jewish council. This is the Sanhedrin of Pharisees and Sadducees, this, this group of respected people that oversee religious things, and they don't like what they hear, and they all rush against him. I mean, they're, they're, maybe you've read stories about like maybe a, a person with conservative views is uh, invited to, uh, to speak. I think it happened not too long ago at Yale Law School, and, and this person spoke, and the students all you know, ganged up on her and um, they started to bang on their desk and screaming and so on. There was the other situation where someone had to hide in a classroom for three hours, you know, where they're just, we don't want to hear anything that's other than us. In our quest for free speech, we don't want to hear what you have to say. So the same thing, they just rushed against him and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now, um, the way the Jews kill people is by throwing stones at them until they're dead. The way Romans kill people is by crucifying them. Jesus was killed by the Romans in a Roman kind of way. Stephen is killed by the Jews in the Jewish kind of way. And it's interesting how with Jesus, um, you know, they, they, they hadn't just sort of taken him into their own hands and taken him and and thrown him out and stoned him. They went through the legal system. But with Stephen, they're so upset, they drag him out of the city and begin to stone him. They just take the law completely into their own hands. It's this violent mob. And then the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Um, this is significant that Luke just introduces the key figure who he's going to soon in chapter 9 tell about the conversion of Saul, 
the one who is going to be the greatest enemy of the church, that he just mentions, here's kind of the initial appearance of Saul, that those that are going to be throwing stones at Stephen, and that would be a terrible way to die, to have stones, it's kind of a slow, painful way to die. Those that were throwing stones laid their feet at uh, lay their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then Saul in his letters mentions, you know, he just, the, the guilt he still feels over the fact that he was there cheering them on when they stoned Stephen. And while they were stoning Stephen prayed, it's interesting we have two things that Stephen says at the time of his dying. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. And notice how similar they are to two of the seven last words of Jesus, which tells me that Stephen probably was present at the cross. There, while they were stoning, stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And when he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. Now we'll get in just a, a minute or two to these two statements of Stephen similar to two of the seven last words of Jesus. But I first want to talk about the fact that he, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I mentioned on the study sheet that the Bible usually describes Jesus as sitting at the right hand of the Father, like in the Apostles' Creed. You know, he ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and there will judge the quick of come returning and judge the living and the dead. Usually Jesus is, sit, is sitting at the right hand of the Father which is a position of power and authority, credibility, and so on. And I think the reason that Jesus is usually pictured as sitting, that is emphasizing the fact that he has completed his work of making possible our salvation. For example, in Hebrews 10, 12, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, as opposed to the Old Testament prophet sacrifices where there had to be repeated sacrifice, Christ, a, a single sacrifice himself, a sacrifice for all time, once for all, a single sacrifice for sin, for all people, for all time. Once he had done that, his work was completed. He sat down at the right hand of God. But here in verses 55 and 56, Jesus is described as standing at the right hand of God. And I'm not aware of any other time in the Bible where it talks about Jesus as standing at the right hand of God. So as I see it, Jesus is giving Stephen a standing ovation. And isn't that absolutely the best possible way to end your life, to have Jesus giving you a standing ovation? Now let's talk about those two things that Stephen had said. As he was dying, he said two things that sound very much like two of the seven last words of Jesus. The first thing Stephen said was, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus had said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Something he cried with a loud voice. He was strong enough at the time of his death to be able to cry with a loud voice. Another thing that Stephen said was, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Jesus had said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's interesting that the two things that Stephen said that sound so similar to what Jesus said are, are two of the seven last words both mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. Well, isn't that amazing to be have Christ in your life so strongly that even though you are dying in the worst possible way, you are saying you have the mind of Christ. Even in the things that you are saying, you are giving witness to your faith in Jesus. To, have be, to have, be so close to Jesus that even in the most difficult time, you, you approach things as Jesus did. Now, the psalm for this Sunday is Psalm 31. And part of Psalm 31, verse 5, is that verse that I believe Stephen and Jesus were quoting. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me. And, and I, I, I just wonder if this is a prayer, Psalm 31, that Jesus and Stephen had learned as good children, as young children. 
You know, um, the time to learn faith stabilizing and faith reinforcing scriptures is before you need them. I mean, there are stories of, of prisoners of war who, who said that, that while they were in prison, not l knowing how long it was going to be, they remembered Bible verses that they had learned or they remembered hymns that they had learned. They said that the things that they had learned as children were there as a resource for them. I remember many times in teaching confirmation as I was trying to get them to learn the small catechism and Bible verses and, and songs and so on. You know, it's telling them about prisoners of war who so valued at a time, the worst time of their lives. They said, you know, I learned what I need. I, I, res I learned then as a child what I need now. You know, the time to learn those things that you might need, that you will need later in life is before you need them. Because when you need them, it is too late. And so I ask the question, what are some scriptures that you are so glad that you have learned so that you know them, you can draw on them, they can help you at the time when you are most need them, when you are most need them. Now, what happens after the death of Stephen? That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. I mean, Paul is, Saul is described as like this raging animal going around rounding up Christians. A severe, not just a persecution, but a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. It's interesting that before the ascension, Jesus had said to the disciples, you'll receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the city you're in now, Judea, the surrounding area, Samaria, the area to the north that you are somewhat different from, and ends of the earth, a people that you are very different from. But even though he had told them to get out, and then in Matthew's account, go and make disciples of all nations, they hadn't done that. Just They just all stayed, stayed home. And it was interesting how it was the death of the first martyr that actually scattered the church and how the scattering of the church actually helped accomplish good because the witness was then spread out. So, it, um, so here's an example of, of what it took to get them to just not hang around in Jerusalem and also the good thing that could result even from the worst of situations. So what good thing might result from the way in which the church is now being scattered when have you experienced maybe a, a disaster in your life and then afterwards you are able to say, see how God was able to make even that work out uh, for good. Now let's look briefly at the gospel reading from John 14 and then we're going to be, uh, that's the gospel, <clears throat> further into John 14 is the gospel reading for next Sunday and then John 17 is the following Sunday. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell about um, the Last Supper and Jesus is giving them the Lord's Supper. You know, bread and wine, this is my body, this is my blood. Ma those are, that account is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't tell about that part of the Last Supper, but he does tell about some other things. John is 21 chapters long. It's interesting that five of the 21 chapters 13 through 17, all have to do with things that Jesus said and did the night of the Last Supper, in the upper room and then on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. In John 13, he uh, washes their feet and gives them the command to, to love one another. John 14, let not your hearts be troubled and so on. And then at the end of John 14, they leave the upper room John 15, as I am the vine, you are the branches. So my guess is that they pass through a vineyard on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. John 16, he tells about how I'm going to be leaving them, how he will be leaving them. And then John 17 is the longest recorded prayer of the Bible in the Bible, the uh, longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible. And then when you get to John 18, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
So all of this is during the things that happened in the upper room as well as on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's take a look at this map here. Um, this is the temple area. The traditional site of the Last Supper is here, the upper room. And then after being there in John 13 and John 14, they, they leave, they cross this Kedron Valley. They come up to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays, agonizes in the garden, and then is arrested. And then he's taken here to the high priest Caiaphas's house um, in order to uh, be, be, he's arrested and then tried and so on. He is finally condemned by Pilate, sentenced to death here. This is the Roman fortress that oversaw the Temple Mount. And then the way in which he carried the cross, the Via Dolorosa, will be here to Golgotha, where he was crucified, and then the tomb where he was buried. So um, in John 14, they are here. 13 and 14, they are here. And then at the end of 14, they leave, and they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is in John 18. What are some of the things that Jesus said? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Is your heart today particularly troubled? And if so, about what? I go and prepare a place for you. Now, if, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am there you may be also. If Jesus has been spending this long a time preparing a place for us, it must be a pretty amazing place. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is not just saying, I'm the one who shows the way. He says that I am the way. He doesn't say, I am a way, way one among many. Rather, he says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have access to God, only, all access to the Father, only through Jesus. Some people are offended by that kind of a statement. But Jesus is saying, you know, I think not so much of the way to approach this is to realize that Jesus has provided a way. The one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus says that asking in his name according to his will and in line with his purposes will link us to him. By means of prayer, his power is made available to us. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If we pray for things that are within the will of God, things that will glorify the Father, well, Jesus said, I will do them. If that statement is not enough to get us to pray, I do not know what would be enough. Things happen or do not happen when we pray. I gave, for example, in Genesis, some, some three examples. In Genesis 18, God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He goes to Abraham. Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what if there are 50 righteous people? Will you save it? God agrees. What about 45? What about 40? And finally, well, what, if, what about if there are 10? You know, uh, if there are 10 righteous people, will, will you save the city? God was willing to... To, to spare the city based upon small numbers in response to Abraham's prayer. In Exodus 4, 17, there's a battle on the way not too long after they uh, leave Egypt between Israel and the Amalekites. And as the, the, the success in battle was dependent upon Moses' praying for the soldiers. And, you know, you lift up your hands and, and lift up your hands and they get really tired real soon. And so he wasn't able to continue to hold his hands up. So that's the place where they then had Moses sit on a stone and Aaron and Hur uh, would hold up his hands, showing that there are times where we simply need somebody else to help hold us up when we are praying. Or Ezekiel 22.30. God told the prophet that he would be more than willing to show mercy to his people if he were to find even one intercessor to stand in the gap and plead on, on their behalf. If I only find one to, to intercede for God's people, I'm willing to show mercy. 
Now, Stan in the Gap, here's a uh, picture of a, um, of a prayer gathering. Stan in the Gap, Promise Keepers, back in October of 1997, had a prayer gathering for our country uh, on the National Mall. Uh, 600, 700,000, they say, were gathered there. And this was a prayer for the country to stand in the gap on behalf of the country. Now, if you look on the map, here is the, the castle, the, the Smithsonian. And if you start at this end and you go halfway across, guess who you'll find? Me. <laughs> so if you look real carefully, you can find me right there. A couple other things that were interesting. The, also, they had um, all these jumbotrons. And, um, and Mick Jagger was mad because he had wanted all those jumbotrons for a Rolling Stones concert, but they had been committed to this prayer rally instead so that he was not able to have those jumbotrons for the, the Rolling Stones. And I remember also they had 1,500 porta potties and they had brought in Stand of the Gap uh, versions of the Bible um, and kind of Stand of the Gap pictures and so on. They had, they had pallets with one million Bibles, and that's kind of, that's quite impressive. Well, that, that was, you know, the, the whole idea was to stand in the gap. And I remember the person who um, introduced the offering, one of these really hyper speakers, and he said, if you want someone else to give but not you, you are creating a gap rather than standing in the gap. Well, this is quite a statement. God says, if, if I find even one intercessor to stand in the gap and plead, I will show mercy. You know, we need to stand in the gap for our country. God releases his grace and power when we pray. In prayer, prayer is a, not a magical way for us to control God. God is Lord. But in prayer, we go before God and ask him to release into the life of someone else something that we ourselves would never be able to supply. The needs of people are beyond what we can do. The needs of our world, our country, our culture are certainly beyond human capacity. But in prayer, we ask God to release, in, release his power which is greater than we are able to supply, something happens when God's people pray. We need to stand in the gap and let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing example of Stephen. We thank you for the way in which the church realized that there was a problem that needed to be dealt with. They didn't ignore it or, or, or just minimize it or discount it, but they said we need to do something. And we thank you that they had a that came up with a solution, a solution that pleased all the people and the ple one that made everybody happy and one that solved the problem so that the growth of the church could continue on. We pray for congregational settings where there are conflicts and conflicted situations which hinder the ministry. We pray that there can be this kind of good resolve to the issue in order to be able to release the ministry to be able to happen. We think of Stephen and we think of how um, he, even in the most difficult time, time of his life, he had the mind of Christ and approached in a Christ-like way uh, that very difficult situation. We thank you for the way in which you were able to make good come about, even from this, this persecution of the church, how the Christians fall, uh, uh, scattered and were dispersed and the good that can come from that. We thank you for the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. And we pray that uh, for those who are particularly troubled right now, that they will experience your presence and your peace. We also pray that um, we will pray for our country, pray for our culture, pray for our world. It needs your power. We pray that we will be your people and do your work. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.